on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. Suspense means letting them know that there's a question, there's a problem, that there's a, a mystery. The readers will come along uh, out of curiosity and concern for the characters to find out the answer to that, to that question. So if you are providing clues, hints along the way, uh, but not revealing the answer yet, yeah. that will be, that's suspense and that's uh, extremely enticing to readers. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. We are here in New York City for Thrillerfest and the first of three special episodes from The Big Apple. Uh, it's me, James Blatch, and it's... Me, Tom Ashford can't help noticing that you're not Mark Dawson. I'm not. No. I noticed that about halfway through. Yeah. Yeah. But halfway through your life, you realise you weren't yeah. Mark Dawson. Yeah. I think a lot of us realise we're not Mark Dawson. Um, Tom, young Tom, finally uh, making an appearance on the main podcast. Uh, it's standing in for Mark. It's the summertime in the Northern Hemisphere, and we're all trying to grab uh, a week here and there of holiday or vacation. Tom, Tom you're here. Yeah. You're going away in August. I'm going away next week. Mark is away this week so the week we've been in thriller fest he's been having a well-earned break well not that much of a break because he keeps emailing us yeah yeah but anyway hopefully he's uh, managed to uh, get some downtime uh, it's important to do that in all our busy lives we've had uh, a really really good week at thriller fest now i will say from the outset and i'll be very interested tom to hear your views on thriller fest uh, through these episodes um, it is still without question a quite traditional publishing event. Uh, a lot of the marketing advice they give is to do with book tours and signings and stuff that, you know, I think a lot a lot of people in the indie world have worked out probably isn't worth the time. And there's not a lot about uh, paid Facebook ads or anything like that ever. Uh, anyway, however, a large part of, in fact, the first few days are called Craft Fest, and they have been about the craft of writing with some of the most brilliant writers uh, and that has been extremely good, hasn't it? Yeah. Is that it? Thanks. That's is that all you're going to say in this it, podcast? Yes. Yeah, it's very, very focused on craft. Um, and it is very useful. I think there were the few indie like, authors that we we met out here have, have found it pretty useful. Uh, but yeah, it's very much more on the writing side and less on the marketing. Yeah, that's certainly true. But um, uh, we are going to bring you through these three episodes a clutch of interviews. I think we may have 14, something like that in all. So what you're going to get uh, is divided up neatly into the areas that we've covered. You're going to get the very best of what people have been learning here in Thriller Fest for free, just for being uh, a viewer, listener of the self-publishing show. Uh, I should say where we are. We're actually in Dumbo. I, I can't remember exactly what Dumbo stands for. Something to do with underneath Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, but Brooklyn Bridge is away uh, on that side. We'll show you a shot of that. Behind us is Lower Manhattan, the iconic skyline, perhaps the most iconic skyline on the planet. Uh, you might be able to see the Statue of Liberty if we move out the way. Just out. Lady Liberty is, is out there. There's a cormorant just flying past. I don't know if you caught that. Uh, and we're going to be here to record the links, but we've been busy in a, the Hyatt, the Grand Hyatt, uh, right next to Grand Central Terminal uh, in Midtown, where we've been uh, busy all week. Right. We're going to start, we've divided up the interviews, as I say, into good subjects for you. And we're going to start uh, with uh, some ideas to the overall pace and moments that you want to hit in your narrative, in the plot of your book. So there are a couple of specific talks and sessions on that. The first person we're going to listen to is Meg Gardner. And Meg has talked very specifically about plot twists, how important they are, how to do them, how to get them right, how not to overload uh, your uh, reader. And we're going to start with her and then we're going to move straight on to Kimberly Howe. Now Kimberly Howe's actually uh, KJ Howe. You, many of you will know her as a thriller writer. She's actually quite a big week in the whole Thriller Fest organization. So we talked to her a little bit about the conference and then she talked about pacing, that all important thing in thriller writing. And she should know she's got million book sales behind her. Uh, I can't remember what exactly her figure is, but she's got a lot behind more us. us. More than us, more than us. Okay, so let's hear from Meg and KJ Howe, and then we'll be back to uh, give you another uh, segment of fantastic insight from Thrillerfest. 
This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. I'm Meg Gardner. I'm the author of 14 thrillers. I write uh, fast-paced, high-octane uh, stories featuring strong female protagonists, and I hope well, readers will stay up all night reading them. Fantastic. Well, that sounds like a, a laudable aim for any novel writer. Okay, so you've just uh, presented a session on plot twists, mm -hmm. and uh, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about that, Meg, uh, and then we'll talk about your writing as well. So first of all, the plot twist, um, I would think from a thriller writer point of view, uh, an essential, right? Not essential in every single thriller, but readers love them. Uh, writers will gain uh, a greater ability to uh, surprise, delight, uh, bring people back gasping for more if they learn how to write a plot twist, which is some unsuspected occurrence or turn of events in the story yeah, that's that what, radically we changes should, the We difference. should define what <laughs> yes. plot twist is, shouldn't we? I should have asked that first. Okay. So how would, yeah, how would you describe a plot twist? Plot twist, uh, an unsuspected turn of events or occurrence that radically changes the, the course of the story. It's up to the author to figure out how to surprise, which is a, a pretty sophisticated reading audience, and uh, lead them in an unsuspected direction. Okay, so when we're writing, um, we're often uh, taught to give our characters challenges, to force them to be proactive and make decisions. And people who don't plot, who's the pants, the way to use that expression, I think will sometimes come up with a plot twist just on the fly, just think, well, What's the worst thing that could possibly happen to my character now to mm -hmm. get in their way of doing something? Is that the type of thing we should be looking at, suddenly creating the, the death of a key figure or something? It can work brilliantly. It's, if you come up with what you think is a great surprise, you need to uh, stop and think, how would you logically get your characters to that point? Again, you're absolutely right. Put your characters to the test. The plot doesn't really develop unless uh, a character is challenged, forced to make choices, uh, unless there's conflict. So we don't want things just to happen, to, especially to the protagonist. That is the death of the story. You have to have a character who takes control at some point, rises to the challenge, picks up the baton, runs with it, and makes a difference in the story. If your protagonist doesn't do that, if everybody else is doing that, then you haven't written the protagonist. You've written the, you know, the dude who's sitting at the cafe, yeah. you know, having a cup of tea who needs to who needs to go back and do that and have somebody else come in and be your protagonist. Plot twists, random, you know, like yet another asteroid hitting the the ballpark. Uh, probably not what you want. You want them to arise out of character, out of the circumstances, out of the conflict between uh, the characters. Uh, out of the culture of their world. So you need to think about it. If you come up with a brilliant idea, pin that to the wall and think about how you can write backwards and forwards to make sure that that really fits, that, it, that it set, it's set up and that it uh, then launches from that point. Do you have some good examples of classic plot twists that we should think about? Classic plot twists. I will give you some plot twists that are so well known in popular culture that I'm not spoiling them, I hope. Okay. Uh, of the course. T Titanic sinks when it hits the yeah. iceberg. We got that out of the way. <laughs> Titanic is actually a perfect example of how not every story needs a plot twist. Yeah. You know, millions yeah. of teenage girls, <laughs> my daughter included, went into that movie, saw it 45 times, knowing exactly what happened. Yeah. But famous plot twists, uh, you can use misdirection, uh, make readers viewers think that the story is going along on this level while there's actually something else happening underneath. Of course, The, the Sixth Sense is yes. a classic plot twist where the psychologist has spent the movie helping a troubled young boy who says he sees dead people. Of course, it's actually the psychologist who's being helped by the young boy because he's, uh, he's the dead person. But when you, you're shocked, you gasp, but when you go back and think back through the whole film, you see that that's been set up. Uh, brilliantly and shown and hinted at all through the movie. Um, Luke. Luke, yeah. I mean, I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Yes. Uh, 12 years old, I didn't see it coming. That's exactly, I didn't either. Uh, Obi-Wan never told you what happened yeah. to your father. And then you've got two movies worth of plot where you've been led to think that, that Luke's quest has been driven by this whole disaster, this whole evil event that 
the man he's confronting now killed his father. Yeah. And it turns out... It turns out th that's not exactly what happened, is no. it? No. Yeah. And oh, that's a very good example. Also, you talked earlier about building in and building in it, working mm -hmm. up to it and then working away from it. Because after that point, then Luke's mission changes from wanting to destroy Vader to wanting to save him. Precisely. At that moment. So it becomes, instead, it, instead of becoming being a revenge plot, it becomes a redemption story. Yeah. So I th I th I th there's a lot of redemption you got to do with Darth Vader, but uh, Luke's going to go try for it. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's that. Is a, they're two two wonderful examples. Um, the two thoughts occur to me. One is the kind of the whole conceal reveal. And I'm a first time novelist. I've my novels this year, and hopefully at the latter stages now, the revision process. But one of the difficulties I had in my first couple of drafts was not really understanding how much to conceal from the reader. I concealed far too much uh, and hinted at things so mm -hmm. that they were a surprise. And um, my editor started to talk to me, started to explain to me how you want to take people on the journey. Mm -hmm. They want to enjoy the decisions being made, right. not suddenly discover something after. So there's a balance here, isn't there, with a the plot twist? Absolutely. Suspense and surprise can, can bolster each other or they can uh, be at odds. And exactly like you, when I first started writing, I thought it was brilliant to just withhold all the information and then spring it on the readers at the end. But, but that meant they just kind of, you know, burbled along on a yeah. you know a very slow pace and it's less to, interesting for them it's much less interesting yeah. for them suspense means um, letting them know that there's a question there's a problem that there's uh, a mystery uh, you ra the author raises a question uh, but then doesn't provide the answer the readers will come along uh, out of curiosity and concern for the characters to find out the answer to that to that question so if you are providing clues hints along the way uh, but not Revealing the answer yet yeah. that will be that's suspense and that's uh, extremely enticing to readers. And I think maybe Da Vinci Code's a really good example of that because you read the book and you find yourself as a reader ahead of the characters because they've raised the questions they're looking for the answers and I think yeah. Dan Brown cleverly writes the book so that your readers are ahead of the game. It's it? an extremely clever novel and that's a that's a way to uh, to, to create suspense. Uh, by creating the mystery for the reader at some points is ahead of the characters because then you become concerned for the characters. Oh, they don't know about, you know, that the bad guys are waiting, uh, lying in wait for them ahead. So you, you're biting your nails, hoping that they will figure it out or, or manage to escape some, some disaster that's uh, being set up for them. So it's a balance and that's what rewriting's for. That's what yes. revision and editing. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and as you alluded to earlier, you can go overboard with this, I'm guessing. There's a, there's a danger of putting too many plot twists in it. Of course, if you just are trying to twist, you know, you don't want people to be like on some amusement park ride where they get nauseated by <laughs> because they're spinning too fast. It has to land, each twist needs to land emotionally. Uh, to, is it going to be a, a revelation, uh, a cliffhanger, some kind of escalation in the story, a complication, or is, is a secret revealed? Is, is, is someone betrayed? Is, is someone's love professed that you never saw? You never saw coming, but it ha it has to land emotionally. Otherwise, it will just feel like a you know a, an amusement park ride. And those are entertaining, but that's not what gets readers to remember your characters or want to want to come back to your, your work. You, sorry, you're a, a thriller writer, and we're here at Thriller Fest, so we're talking mm -hmm. about thrillers. But actually, this would go to almost any genre, I think, even a, a romance book or Absolutely. just having that same, yeah, that, that same. Um, yeah, in a, in a, in a, in a rom romance novel, it's probably less likely that somebody will be revealed to be an you know, international super assassin. But uh, well, they might be revealed to be having an affair with somebody else. Precisely. Or, you know, and, you know, the same principles of suspense, plot twists apply in, in all drama. <laughs> and they have across uh, millennia. Yeah. So do you plan your plot twists or when you're doing your first draft, your rough draft, or do you allow it to spill out of you? Do I plan my twists? Yes, I, I try to. I, 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 I outline, um, so I try to build the story, and as I'm developing it, I try to see where it's becoming predictable and, and figure out how I could send it in a different direction. Uh, I write a complete outline, but then as I start drafting the story, as I am you know, bringing the characters more fully onto the page, hearing their voices as I write dialogue, seeing how they interact in their world. Sometimes I come up with what I think is a better idea that will, yeah. will enrich the characters, provide a deeper, you know, a deeper surprise and 
lead to a, a more dramatic plot. So if I come up with something better, I go with that. Yeah, well, that's what that process is for uh -huh. as well, isn't it? And in your session, how did you set about teaching plot twists? What was the aim of your session? The aim of the session was to explain what a plot twists are, uh, how they work in the story to increase suspense, drama, uh, surprise, and to talk to craft fest participants about how they can learn to uh, hopefully create plot twists and then techniques to build them into the story themselves. You know, do, they, do you hide them as clues? Do you withhold information? Do you use misdirection? Uh, do you decide that anybody can die? Uh, do you uh, use flashback foreshadowing ways to, uh, to, to use to, to cleverly conceal build and then reveal a, a surprising twist in the story. I love a bit of foreshadowing. Yeah. I love a bit of foreshadowing. Um, so do you see um, plot twists? Well, what, what do you see the main purpose of a plot twist in a book? Is it, is it to do with the character or is it to do with the, the story and the entertainment for the reader? All three. Okay. <laughs> Obviously, plot and character are intertwined. Plot is what the characters do. That's, you know, yes. that's about there, the push and pull and the conflict between them. So a plot twist um, takes readers in a, readers love surprise. It, it just makes it part of the entertaining experience for them. Um, if you can have a surprise that makes them care more about the characters, then you know, they invest themselves into the journey that the characters are on. So it's, uh, it just, it, it may come on. Yeah. It makes it a lot more fun. Yeah, yeah, it does. And I'm thinking some books, or mystery books, uh, Red Sparrow, uh, mm -hmm. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, books like that, they're built around their twists. I mean, the, the reader, I'm not sure if Red Sparrow was a book first or a film. It was a book. It was yeah. a book, wasn't it? So the reader goes into those books basically because they're buying a <laughs> ticket for the twist, right? They are, and... I didn't have time to talk about it in my session. Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, it actually tells you the, the title gives away yes. a bit yeah. of what, what the twist is going to be. <laughs> Tinker, Taylor, yeah. Soldier, Spy, mm. uh, you know it's all about hunting a mole. Yeah. And uh, so you know that pretty much up front. So the question then becomes how, you know, Le Carre builds all the, the uncertainty of, you know, the hall of mirrors that these people live in to, to figure out who could be doing this, why, and what's going to happen when they're... You know, it's not just revealing the identity no. of the mole. It's, no. it's about how this affects the entire structure of uh, the people who work for, yeah. you know, for the Secret Intelligence Service. Keep them guessing in that case. Yeah. Meg, well, look, thank you so much for chatting to us. Mm -hmm. um, did you get a good response from your audience today? They seem like they were ready to go right, so that's about as much as I could ask for. Perfect. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Kimberly. Here we are, back in Thriller Fest, and I have to say, you are looking remarkably calm, considering <laughs> this is like the top of the mountain now, isn't it? A lot of work must have taken place between the end of last year and today. Well, I mean, we work all year long and try very hard to prepare ahead of time, so that on site, it's really just execution. And I'm very lucky to have a phenomenal team. And we have about 15 staff and over 200 volunteers who help run the conference. And it's sort of also like, um, as a conference coordinator, you need to be a duck. Very, very calm on the surface and paddling a lot underneath. Furiously moving exactly. underneath. Uh, but it's a fantastic event. It's Thank you. Uh, a place where we, I think we just mentioned it, I particularly enjoy just rubbing shoulders with some of the great stars and the people who've got fantastic bestsellers after bestseller mm -hmm. to their names, film adaptations, TV adaptations. Mm -hmm. And you're talking to them and you suddenly realize when you're talking to them, they're just humans who talk about hard work, characters that are compelling, and a reason to turn the page. There's no magic or secret about it, which is quite of inspiring. Well, I think most people are not overnight successes. To be successful in publishing, you generally have to study the craft for a long time and then put in the time to build an audience. So someone like Lee Child, I mean, I believe he said he, it was like between book eight and 10 where he started to see enormous success. And C.J. Box um, found he was a New York Times bestseller on his 11th book. So I think when you see that, you know, you realize that it does take time. With social media these days, sometimes there can be overnight successes, like Gone Girl. You know, but, but actually, if you think about it, 
um, Gillian Flynn wrote Sharp Objects before that. So it wasn't really an overnight success. It was just her most successful book and it blew up and her career has really continued to flourish. Why do you get involved in Thriller Fest? What brought you into the mm -hmm. organizational side of it? Well, I came to the very first Thriller Fest in Phoenix, Arizona, and I volunteered. And my goal was to write thrillers. I was a former medical writer, and for me it was an opportunity to learn the craft because journalistic style writing that you use in medical work is very, very different than the dramatic showing that you need to do with thrillers. So as a result, I just really wanted to study the craft, and I knew that, that Thriller Fest had an incredible education program, and that's what drew me in. And then uh, before I knew it, I started volunteering, and guess what? Now I'm lucky to be executive director. Yeah, and um, we'll talk about your writing in a no moment, because I, I want to talk about your writing in a moment, but I'm interested to know um, about the sort of community that's built up around Thriller Fest, because there's almost a family atmosphere amongst the people who arrive and attend this event. And I guess that's what you've aimed for, but it's, it's big. It's a thousand people as well. Sure. There's an intimacy we have here, and I think it's because we don't have a VIP room or a green room. Everybody's out on the floor mingling and talking, and that's what we wanted to create. We wanted to create caring, um, supportive. Some of our top authors mentor others, give back, to, you know, help others grow their careers. We have a, an incredible debut program as well. So we really emphasize helping people start their career the right way. And we also have something for aspiring authors where they come and they study the craft and then they polish their manuscript and master class. And then when they're ready, they can pitch to the agents at Pitch Fest. So we kind of have, I would say, from A to Z, how to get published and how to be successful in the thriller market. And at the same time, do you feel that you cater for people who want to take the indie route? 110%. We, we actually realize that, you know, if you look at the statistics, right, not everyone's going to be traditionally published. And it may not work well for some people. And we encourage those, you know, to study both avenues and to decide what would work best for them. Some marketing gurus love the indie route because they do very well. Yeah. People who like the, uh, the nuts and bolts of marketing, it's not for everyone, but for the people who like it, it can be very successful. Um, and that's what we're all about really on this show. So, mm -hmm. and, uh, but I also am reminded that it doesn't really matter how you get published. Mm -hmm. The writing side of it, which is what we're talking about most of the time with people, is the same. Very true. And I mean, I think there's so much emphasis on writing the best book possible because at the end of the day, that's what readers come back for. If you write a very good book, and they're satisfied at the end, they'll be looking for your next book. So Kim, talking about books. So you're a medical writer. I was. Um, what does that mean? Sure, so what I did, there's many different types of medical writers, but in my case, I did a lot of patient education. So I would take complex medical issues, you know, like about how to handle diabetes or heart or blood pressure, anything like that, and make it very accessible for people to read about. So I would do you know, uh, you know, you go to the drugstores and you get brochures. I would do some of those. I would do calendars. I would do a host of different things, just trying to educate people on good health. Okay. Mm. But there was a, a desire within you to, uh, to expand the writing into fiction. Well, let me tell you, I, I, as much as I enjoyed learning about, you know, writing medical things and research and that, it's a lot more fun to make stuff up and blow stuff up. Sure. Kill, <laughs> kill people and resurrect exactly. some people. Yeah. It's very good therapy. Yeah. <laughs> so when did that start for you? Well, a few years ago, I went back into my master's in creative writing because I wanted to study, you know, how to show or how to dramatize the action properly, as I mentioned, the different type of writing. And from there, I was very lucky um, to be able to uh, write the Freedom Broker, which I was very, very honored to win the best first novel last year. And I've been studying Kidnap and Ransom for six years. So I've immersed myself in that world on purpose so that I can write with authenticity about my character who's a female um, kidnap negotiator named Thea Paris. So K and R is your thing. It certainly is. Which is a fascinating world. And as you say, yeah. suddenly it is a little bit more exciting than, although very important to tell people how to uh, take their drugs properly, but I can see the alert. Well, I kind of combine the two because Thea Paris, my character, actually has type 1 diabetes. Okay. I noticed that many um, lead characters, you know, didn't have any physical illnesses other than alcohol or drug addiction, which seems sure. to be the case. And I thought to myself, there's so many people out there with chronic illnesses. I want to be representative of that. And so I thought it'd be really good to have Thea have something like this. And she needs insulin to survive. So at the end of the day, I think it's really critical, you know, that 
um, you have this ticking time bomb. If this character doesn't get their insulin, she won't survive. Yeah, it's very relatable. Mm. Unfortunately, very relatable very. to lots of people. Well, 400 million people across the globe have diabetes. Yeah. So yeah, you're doing brilliantly. We should say that they have decided to start hoovering the uh, smoke detectors. And there's a man, there's one right above you. So I fear at any moment <laughs> it's going to get even louder. But let's, uh, let's persevere because these mics are very good at picking us up. Um, so we should tell people you write under KJ. I out. certainly do. Yeah. And how many books have you published now? So I have The Freedom Broker, which is the first in the series. And then the second book is called Skyjack. And I had a great time researching aviation. And that was a lot of fun. And if you want to know how to break into a cockpit, give you're it the, a read. You're the person. That, I have researched and found a way. That puts us on a watch list. <laughs> just by Probably. Having I'm sure I am because of the things I research yeah. and the people I talk to regularly. I mean, that is a really fun thing when you're working at how to mm. break into a bank vault or open the door on a, a, an airline cockpit. I'd be interested to, to hear what you found out about that. Well, I would invite you to read because, but, but it was very, very intriguing to learn everything about aviation. I was, I benefit greatly from experts from both aviation and kidnapping. Um, I'm very fortunate to know some of the top kidnap negotiators in the world. Uh, there are over 40,000 kidnappings a year and it's growing. And the main reason is um, military and police in developing countries are not getting paid and they need to put food on the table for their families. So they've turned to kidnapping as a way of making a living as well as terrorism because it's a great fundraising mechanism. A lot of terrorists like ISIS have used oil for you know, money and now that that's dried up, um, they've turned to kidnapping because if you think about it, there's an endless supply of you know, humans which they see as commodities that yeah. they can trade for finances. Yeah, it certainly is a growing issue. There's been some great uh, fact, you know, true story books on this subject, people who've been on the wrong end of that Absolutely. in recent years. Um, so Kim, here we are uh, for 2019. Thriller Fest continues to grow, I think. It's Absolutely. Every year. And we're very lucky. We have um, over 3 billion books in print when you count up all of our members. We have over 5,000 members in over 52 countries. Yes, because we should say there is the International Thriller Writers Association. Is That's that? correct, yeah. yeah. The sort of umbrella organization. That is correct. And, and it's wonderful because for published authors, it's free to join. And our, we're a not-for-profit organization, and our whole mandate is to support thriller authors. So everything we can do to help others, we will. So what's the, what are the benefits for somebody joining? Absolutely. There's a multitude. We have an e-newsletter called The Big Thrill that goes out to thousands and thousands of people. We do interviews and you know, features on each um, authors when they have releases. We um, definitely support the debut team with the whole support system. We have incredible publicity opportunities for them. Basically everything you can imagine you would need to get your book out there in front of the public. Okay, superb. Well, we want to thank you for the work that you put in. I know it's, um, you know, you don't do it for the money, let's put it that way, organizing a conference like this, and there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears going into it. We just swan in at the last minute and enjoy it. So well, we should say thank you to you. Th thank you for coming because, you know, it's, it's really a joy. We call it summer camp for writers. And I hope that you'll return year after year and spread the word because I think it's a very positive, nurturing environment in which, you know, people with the same kind of voices in their head all gather together to share their, you know, passion. Even if those voices are telling them to smash open a cockpit. So true, I know. But see, we find like-minded people here and that's what we need. Yes. So it's fantastic. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. That was KJ Howe rounding off that first couple of interviews. We started with Meg Gardner talking about plot twists, KJ Howe talking about pacing and thrillers. And of course, we talked to her about Thriller Fest itself. Um, so Tom, an experienced novelist. Some, some would say, arguably. Well, you've written nine novels. Yes. Yeah, experienced novelist, not experienced marketer. Yeah, you're getting into the marketing Absolutely. side of things now. Um, but did that resonate with you? We talk, I mean, these are critical factors to getting the, the novel that someone's going to want to read and turn the page. Yes. Do you have anything to expand okay. on when it comes to pacing? and? Um, well, yeah, I mean, you, they, the sessions were very useful. And um, obviously, you don't want to create a novel that's going to, anyone's going to want to put down. Because as yeah. soon as someone puts down a novel, they just go off and do something else, particularly with stuff like Netflix and then instant gratification sort of uh, media now. 
But if anyone, if someone can put down your novel, then there's there's always a fair chance they're not going to pick it back up. So yeah. you kind of want them to be, if, if they have to put it down because they have to go to sleep or go to work or something that you know they'll intentionally have to do, then you want them to be wanting to pick it up as soon as they get back, not sort of just put it to the side and yes. do something else. It needs to be unputdownable yeah. to name Mark Dawson's publishing company. Um, We've got helicopters about to come and drown us out. It reminded me a bit, Meg's uh, interview reminded me a bit of Peter James, who was here again this year. We spoke to him last year, and we're going to get the explicit tag now, but Peter James said that you need that f me moment in your book, and that's what Meg was getting at, really, is it's got to be that I didn't see it coming. And we've got, a, we've got James Rollins uh, coming up in the podcast after next, and he's brilliant at that. He's brilliant at having that moment where you think, I did not see that coming, and then the whole book takes a, a tangent. So very important things. Okay, now, the next couple of interviews are all about psychology. So this is about layering your characters. It's about getting uh, not just that one-dimensional villain, or something we talk about a lot, or, or hero. Where do you get those complexities from? Where do you get those flaws from? And how... Th these are two people who talked about how to uh, derive from real life the sort of things that are going to make your characters become realistic and compelling for your reader. We're going to start with David Corbett. I love this interview. David thinks a lot about these moral, you know, when you're in school and you talk about these ethical dilemmas about the train going down the track, it's going to kill one child playing on the track or everybody on board and it's your choice who you save and so on. Um, but he's really taken that on a little bit to play with those ideas and then suggested that that's what we do to our character, mainly to our hero, our protagonist. We put them in these almost impossible to solve moral dilemmas. Uh, so let's, uh, let's talk to him first and then we'll be back for our last interview for this episode. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. I'm David Corbett. I'm the author of six novels. The last was The Long Lost Love Letters of Doc Holliday. I've written one book on craft, The Art of Character. There's going to be a follow-up this October called The Compass of Character on Complex Motivation for Long Format TV and uh, Novels. And uh, I was a private investigator for 15 years before I started writing my novels. I worked on the Michael Jackson case, the People's Temple trial, the DeLorean case, and a whole slew of cases related to a group of guys out of Coronado, which is near San Diego. It was called the Coronado Company. They were the major marijuana smugglers on the West Coast through the late 70s and, uh, and 80s. Basically, Navy brats and Vietnam vets who brought in 50-ton loads at a time onto the West Coast and distributed it. Wow. Yeah. So you've been there all the cultural touch points of my life. You were <laughs> in the background of the Michael Jackson trial and DeLorean. I, I remember DeLorean happening. Yeah. Wow. You so, weren't part of the bust, were you, to get in with the, uh, the well, setup? Well, the, the firm I worked with had worked on a previous case with the same DEA agents and same informant. Okay. And they had set up a Lebanese business, the businessman with the same techniques. Okay. And there's a crucial interview that, of course, the recording disappears and it's not there. And that's pretty much what they did. They set him up. Not that he wasn't stupid, not that he wasn't greedy, with that, not that he wasn't venal, but he did not agree to a cocaine shipment. That wasn't where he thought the money was coming from. Wow. And once he found out, he tried to get out and they threatened him. But, of course, those recordings are not there. The informant was... The informant had basically betrayed absolutely every human being in his life, even his brother, you know, would no longer speak to him. So it was pretty, that was pretty fascinating. And that was really the first major case I worked on when I got uh, into the, the firm. Now, I'm guessing that these um, experiences have led to your thought and your work in terms of novelization and particularly character. So this morning, you had a session where you spoke about ethical dilemmas, I think. Moral dilemmas. Moral yeah, dilemmas. And, and yeah. how to create moral dilemmas, you know, in the story that forced the character to choose between two totally terrible, you know, unacceptable, Alternatives. Oh, you like both po both options to be. Both options are bad. I mean, if there's a good option, you know, the choice yeah. is easy. You know, okay, it's like, yeah. okay, I've got to choose between two evils. And what do you rely on? Is it a code of conduct that you grew up with and that you rely on, and you, you're a stickler for the rules, or do you think in, in terms of consequences? You know, well, which one will have the, the worst consequences, and for how many people? Uh, do you instead try to live up to an idea of what it means to be a good person, and that's what guides you, or is it, you know, the example of somebody else you knew, or is it just sort of a mishmash of all of that? and that you've never had to make a really bad decision before, and now you have to, and you just don't know. And so, you just have to go fly by the seat of your pants. So what's the advantage, if, for, for those of us writing books, what is the advantage of giving your character an almost impossible set of choices? It identifies them. 
it makes them you know, recognize who they really are when they have to make that difficult choice and they have to stand by it and face the consequences. It's totally life-defining. And it, uh, the decision will haunt them or reward them for the rest of their lives. So it is, well, we always talk about having layered characters and not, not straightforward. And in fact, we've just spoken uh, to James really about the flawed person who's never really sure is a much better hero or villain than the one who's sure of themselves. This oh, yeah. kind of draws that out because nobody can be certain about these decisions. You're no, no, no. And, and, and especially once you realize that you can't realistically foresee the consequences of anything. You never know how it's really going to turn yeah. out. And if you really shorten the time and make it even more dramatic so that the person only has, you know, a few moments at best to have to come to a decision, then they have to live with the fact that if I'd been given more time, maybe I could have had, you know, made a better choice, but I didn't have that. And I have to accept that. And I have to realize that whatever my gut instinct was, wherever it came from, that decided the moment. And that now defines me for the rest of my life. How am I going to live with that? Because there's repercussions. Of oh, yeah. Whichever decision but you can't see them. And you never know that. You know, I mean, I mean you, can, you can guess. But, you know, it, it's really difficult down the road to realize. Like, I'm, I'm sure that all the guys who were thinking that going into Iraq was going to be real easy and a cakewalk and we were going to, you know, b declare victory and walk home. Well, guess what? Yeah. You know, and it's just that consequences almost always are far more complex, far more unfathomable than you can predict. And yet we have to make these kind of decisions every time. And, and the more you can put your protagonist in the position where they have to make that, the more dramatic and compelling they are. Because we can all imagine ourselves in those situations, and we'd like to avoid them, but we can't. When we see the protagonist having to do that, it's usually a transformative moment for him and within the story. And it kicks the story into a completely different gear. So, so we that's what we sort of covered. Think about George W. Bush as president and Tony Blair. Yeah. This day, you know, where they are today at some point during the day, ruminating on that decision that they made. And I'm not going to be cynical about it. I think they had very difficult choices in front of them. It's easy to hold a placard up and say no or yes. Yeah. But the truth is they had to make a call. What's interesting is for us as novelists, exploring that effect on them later. Mm -hmm. That effect on them and, and whether they will, they'll address it or not, honestly. I mean, that also addresses them. I mean, it's very easy. The, the problem with huge events like that for public affairs, um, the realist school is basically designed around the premise that Matters of state rise above matters of individual morality. Uh, that the concerns of the state are so broad and concern so many people that worrying about individual moral concerns can actually impede the best decision. I mean, this goes back to Machiavelli, but you, know, you get it uh, very much in the realist school, which has very much informed, I'd say, US and, and UK policymaking since World War II. And so, and yet, it's not as though it's above morality. You're just saying our morality is that we can't be concerned with the little stuff. We have to see the bigger view, yeah. and we just have to make the tough calls. So it's the, it's the classic theoretical one. I, can, I think I remember this um, from a play of the, the train going down the track, and there's a little child playing on one track, and <laughs> the train goes over a ravine with everyone, the 12 people on board killed or you divert it onto the trap with a child playing, right. and the child gets killed, but you save the people on board. It's your call. Right. That's, that's, that's one of the scenarios. The is other that, one is, is there's five people on one path, there's one person on the other. Which one do you choose? Most people, they say, you know, they'd throw the switch uh, to save the five at the expense of the one. They wouldn't like doing it, but that's an easy call. There's another scenario where, well, let's say that you're actually on a platform above the switch, and you can't reach it but there's a very obese man next to you. And if you push him in front of the train, it will stop it. And only he will die and everybody else will be saved. What do you do? And people recoil from the whole idea of being physically involved and yeah. in having to do something that would harm another person. It's not that one against many calculus. It's a really, that's a really, that's a really classic moral conundrum that comes up all the time. And I'll tell you, every time I've ever talked to a cop about it, she goes, are you kidding? <laughs> Heave the fat man. Yeah, every, time, every day of the week. <laughs> it's just not a, you know, I wouldn't hesitate for a second. So that's kind of, you know. Oops. And I suppose most of the characters who get written in thrillers probably would, I mean, James Bond would instantly see, because he's almost amoral, isn't he? He would push the fat guy, I think. Probably. Well, I've got to tell you, I've got a whole new view of James Bond ever since um, the audiobooks of all the novels came out. Of the original novels. Years. And 
they're by you know, uh, Bill Nighy and a whole bunch of other wonderful British actors and actresses. And so I've rediscovered the books because we do a lot of, we, my wife's family is on one coast and we were on the other. So we were doing these five day drives. So we, audio books were mm -hmm. how we made it through. And we listened to a bunch of those and the books are far more nuanced and he's far more interesting a character than comes across in the films at all. He's, he's nowhere near the just sort of callow, devil may care, you know, he's actually very thoughtful about things and, um, and far more caring toward women than we see him in the films. That's, I found that really interesting. Though he's still a bit of a 50s cad, but yeah. nowhere near as bad as he was no. in the films. So, so to make it more practical then, in terms of, of our thriller writing, mm -hmm. it's a good device for your character to find, to, to engineer some almost... You almost don't want to do it though, do you? When you're writing, you... you it's, I find it quite a pull to create a really horrible situation for my character. No, well, no, and, that, I, and I brought that up in the class. We naturally resist, you know, ourselves wanting to put ourselves in that position. But you know, we have to write those scenes. Um, uh, Stephen James talks about, you know, whatever the problem is, make it worse. And you, we just got to tune ourselves physically, to and, and psychologically to be willing to go into the situation. Just go, okay, what's the worst thing that could happen? All right, then I've got to write that. And I've got to deal with however I feel about it and whatever happens, you know, I just got to get in there. Because we do sort of, we have a tendency to naturally pull back just because of the, the uncertainty and the ugly feelings we, we go through when we're having to face that. But that's what makes stuff interesting. And people are, the reader will ultimately enjoy this because it's a bit like being on a roller coaster or watching a horror film. It's not you. It's... Yeah, exactly. And uh, I mean, one of the, the classic examples I brought from a, from a mystery book was uh, Charles Todd's th uh, series where the, uh, the main protagonist, Rutledge, was a captain in World War I in the infantry. And he had a corporal, uh, Shamish, uh, Hamish, who refused to send his men over the top in uh, direct defiance of an order from, you know, from the high brass. He just said, we're gonna get slaughtered. I'm not gonna do that to my men, I'll refuse. And so for him, he was, uh, Rutledge was in a position where he had to have him convicted of, of insubordination and executed. I mean, one, that's the rule, you know, that's, that's military code of conduct, but two, consequences. He knew that if, if you allow that to happen, I mean, nobody's gonna go over the top. Nobody's gonna, you know, risk going into harm's way because everybody hates the brass. I mean, there's, it's, it's gonna be chaos unless you enforce this in this way. So he's justified it on both the consequentialist and the rule-based grounds. The problem is, the consequences are something he finds himself over time not being able to live with because he had a great deal of respect for this man. And he ends up haunting him and he ends up sort of being the spectral sidekick through the course of the series to just remind Rutledge, you know, you're not the moral man you pretend to be. And maybe you should have more compassion for the people you're investigating. And it really adds a really interesting psychological and moral complexity to the series that I think is really kind of fascinating. The unintended consequences of making the right decision. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Do you think about this philosophi philosophically as well? Is it a good exercise for us to go through as, as humans to oh, put yeah. ourselves in that position? Well, I just, some of the examples I brought up were, you know, the, the, the rubber meets the road here when you actually see in real life experience. And the examples I gave her, you know, you're told not to lie, but then let's say you're in a, a situation, well, you're in an accident with your brother and your, bro and your big brother just says, look, don't tell the parents. You know, just, just don't tell them we got sideswiped, it, got, it got hit in the parking lot. You know, just don't do this to me. I mean, it, it'll kill me if they think I, you know, that I actually did this. And so, little brother, you stand by him. Um, he doesn't get in trouble. And from that point on, he's really nice to you. And what you learn is, okay, you know, every now and then, it's okay to lie. You know, it's situational. And another one I used, this happened a lot in the, uh, the, the town I live in, it was a Navy base. And guys were walking off the Navy base. And these, these were all like blue collar guys. So we were the carpenters, tool guys, plumbers, so on and so forth. And they would just load up their pickup trucks, put a tarp over it and drive it. And there are so many houses in my hometown that were renovated with stuff from the Navy base. And I mean, you see it, I, I hear it from building inspectors just going, oh yeah, I mean, it's like half of the stuff that we had is in somebody's house, you know, in, in, in this community. And of course, the way they justify it was, you know, the Navy was wasteful obscenely wasteful, so what I'm doing is dropping the bucket, and two, I'm really underpaid, and this is my bonus. Yeah. 
And so there's always this situational justification. And if you can put something like that in the character's past, where they sort of learn that, oh no, it's okay to bend the rules if you do it like Uncle John, or if you do it like my brother. There's a personal connection that seems to justify it. Well, what happens if that thing comes up again and that relative isn't there? Are you gonna do the same thing? Or are you gonna do something different this time? Again, it's life-defining. It defines you and your conscience in the moment in, that's in the story. Excellent. But well, David, it's fascinating, really genuinely fascinating. Nice to, well, to great. You. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Yeah. This is great. I'm really glad that you're here because there are some wonderful teachers in this program. Yeah. I was really, really impressed with who they got this year. I just thought it was a great crew. We're, uh, we're, we're talking to the best of them now. <laughs> well, thank thank, you, thank you for saying that. This is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yeah, that was David Corbett, and we've got one more interview for you in this first of three episodes from New York. And this is Dennis Palumbo. He has a great background, and he is going to talk to us in our interview about the psychology of your uh, heroes, villains. Uh, he thinks a lot about trauma. He thinks we live in the age of trauma. We don't fully perhaps understand the effect trauma has on people, but we get into stuff in the interview about decisions that people make and then not just the immediate narrative ramifications of those decisions, but the impact it has on them as characters. Now, before we get into the Dennis Palumbo interview, I must tell you that one of our lovely new cameras decided to focus on a fly on the wall behind him for about seven minutes of this interview, which is not great. So if you're watching on YouTube, I can only apologize, uh, but the interview is great, the audio is fine, but Dennis is out of focus until uh, seven or eight minute mark, something like that, so, uh, but do keep listening. This is Dennis Palumbo. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Uh, my name is Dennis Palumbo. Uh, I spent 20 years writing film and television in Hollywood and then changed careers. And for the last 30 years, I've been a psychologist in private practice. And uh, my specialty is working with creative people, uh, writers, directors, actors. I'm also the author of a series of mystery thrillers uh, featuring a character named Daniel Rinaldi who, like me, was born and raised in Pittsburgh, went to Pitt, uh, has a beard and glasses, and uh, is an Italian-American. Uh, okay. And so uh, he is a trauma expert, and so he consults with the Pittsburgh police, and he specializes in treating victims of violent crime. He himself was a victim. He and his wife were mugged years and years before the book starts. His wife was killed. He was shot, but he survived. And so he struggles with his own survivor guilt as he goes about treating others. And of course, because he's an amateur sleuth, he ends up getting involved in a bunch of mysteries. Sounds like a great setup. Now, the psychological side of it you're talking about there, what yeah. you've been talking about here at Thriller Fest. So I'm going to talk about that with you in a moment. But just tell us about the, the early part of your career, because you had a huge success, quite a high profile success in the early 80s. Well, I was very, very lucky. Uh, I, I was on a number of television shows. I wrote the first episode of Love Boat. I was a writer on Love Love Boat. Boat. Yes. You know, it's funny because when I tell that to people, they always laugh. And then I go, yeah, but I just got a 13 cent residual check from the Balkans, you know, where yeah. those things are still airing, believe yeah. it or not, all over the world. Um, and I was a writer on a show called Welcome Back Cotter, which was a pretty big sitcom. And then I wrote a, a co-wrote a movie called uh, My Favorite Year with Peter O'Toole. Um, and then I, I had a couple other series that I worked on, I think about six series. And then right around that time, around 38, 39, uh, I went into therapy as a patient and fell in love with the process. So I went back to school, started taking classes. I thought to myself, well, it can't hurt a writer to take classes in psychology. But then I began volunteering at psychiatric clinics. And the next thing you knew, I wanted to change my career. And so I did. I retired from film and TV. And I went not only into private practice, but I went back to my first love, which is writing prose. I had been in college, I had always thought I was gonna be a novelist. And through the journeys of life, I ended up in Hollywood writing television and film. But now I get to the opportunity to write novels, which, which I'm very, very pleased about. Okay, well, so you are well <laughs> positioned to talk about the psychology of your characters. Oh yeah. Uh, which is what you've been talking about today. And I guess in, in simple terms, um, this is avoiding your character's 
not having uh, you know credible motivation or being one dimensional that psychology is the key isn't is it not yeah for me what's important is the psychological depth of my characters um, I mean I, I try to make the books as suspenseful uh, as I can with a lot of momentum there's a lot of twists and turns but that doesn't interest me as much as the psychological underpinnings of my characters not only my lead characters but the secondary characters. You know, because my hero treats the victims of violent crime, most thrillers are about catching the bad guy. Mine are too, but they, most thrillers don't really deal with the victims. What happens to them afterwards? What's their life like? What are they going through? What PTSD symptoms might they be having? My character is very involved with that. And so there's a lot of empathy in the book in the books, and also there's a lot of information about what it's like to be a therapist and the state of the mental health community in, in, in modern times. And this is against the backdrop of the police with whom he works, but they have a very uneasy relationship. They, they think my character is just a nuisance, but they end up grudgingly, I think, having some respect for each other. And, I think that's what gives the, the books their meat. And this feels quite sort of zeitgeist as well, because yeah. I think there is a, a, a growing awakening to PTSD and, yeah. and psychological impact. Well, one of the leading trauma experts, uh, Bob Stollero, says that he thinks this is the age of trauma. You know, because of the internet and the media, we now know about pandemics and tsunamis in some country we usually never heard about and there's terrorism. And so there's the sense that there's so much more trauma that we have to absorb. And the internet gives us a 24 seven picture of a world going crazy, which it really isn't, but it feels like it is. Does this worry you? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've got a 15 year old daughter who does have a very bleak outlook on the, on the world. I think mainly because of climate change. Yeah, I think so too. I, I think that actually Climate change is the biggest issue that people aren't quite dealing with the way they should because I think it feels too big for people mm. in a way and I think they don't want to believe it. So we, have a, we do have an escalator being, as far as I can tell, completely rebuilt from the ground up in the background. So there's a bit of clanking going on, but we can hear each other fine. Um, so what did you teach this morning? What was your practical lesson to people here at Thriller Fest? My lesson this morning was about taking your own experience and issues and using them, mining your own experiences and psychological issues and using that to give your characters relevance and relatability. And to use that, you know, uh, Henry James said, plot is characters under stress. Mm -hmm. And so what I tried to do is help people. I did some exercises in the class and then some lecture to get them to see that what goes on inside of them will infuse their writing with a lot more relatability. And do we all have that in us, even if we haven't been to war, been in an Absolutely. accident? Or... I think we have everything in us. As writers, I think we have, you could be a nun or a serial killer. You know, we all have everything. We have all the emotions, you know, anger and yearning and hurt and love and lust and envy. And all, you know, the, the, the way I always put it is, you could like not like your brother-in-law, but if you write crime fiction, you get to run him over in a car. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I yeah. Mean? So you can take the things in your life and just criminalize them. So it's those little moments when it's the sort of falling down <laughs> yeah. thing. The little moments when we imagine suddenly just shooting everybody who's annoying us or yeah. punching the well, like walker. I always say to my wife, I don't want to hurt anyone, but there's certain people whose obituaries I wouldn't mind reading. Yeah. So it's getting in touch with that and putting that into the book and, and, putting and, that and exaggerating book. it. Yeah. Yeah. And exaggerating it and making sure that whatever those excuse me issues are, the plot mechanisms keep stressing those pers that person. That's where yeah. the stakes come from, you know. So if you're, let's say, jealous because your brother invented some internet sensation and he's rich, you want to keep stressing your character by saying, oh, now he's building another thing. He's on the cover of Time magazine. He's so famous, you're now known just as his brother. 
Yeah. And then that builds your resentment. And so we understand why you might do something either to the brother or just out in the world to get your own renown. Well, I think I might be a good pupil of yours already. So my first novels this year, and just on a personal level, uh, my father very sort of non-demonstrative, very, very, very reserved. And my book is about that 1960s stiff upper lip of pushing stuff down deliberately burying it, not confronting it, and the long-term effects of that. So I think yeah. I've already started keying into the sort of things you're talking about. I'm fascinated absolutely. by this. But... Oh, absolutely. I mean, the idea of feelings being uh, suppressed or, or unconsciously repressed uh, is very important because when we read about a character who's super expansive to the point of being histrionic, they're not that interesting. What's interesting is when we get the sense that there's a lot of banked fires there. Mm. There's a lot of feeling that's barely leaking out. And then what stresses the person enough in fiction to make those feelings start to come out? And luckily, being a repressed Englishman, I can, oh, absolutely. I can find my own motivation. Yes, you, you and can find your own. Yeah, absolutely. Not wanting to talk about it. Um, so in terms of practical steps, how do we, if we're looking at our writing now, um, maybe the revision process, what, what things, well, you've given us some examples well, already. Well, I gave, I, in my class, for example, I said to my, my attendees, take a character in one of your work in progress, some work you're doing right now, and give that character a trait of yours, either something you like about yourself, like you're punctual or you always pay your debts or whatever, or something you don't like about yourself, that you're always late, or that you have a lot of envy or whatever, and give that trait to one of the characters in your book and see if that doesn't make the character come more alive. And everyone, when I said, how was this exercise for everybody? Because I gave them like five or six minutes to write a scene with this added trait. And everyone, oh my God, it just came alive. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's sort of the, the when I used to teach writing at UCLA, I would say, let's take a scene where a spy is being chased down an alley. And people would write these scenes, and they look like everything we'd ever seen in a movie before. I said, okay, you're the spy being chased down an alley. And they go, oh, well, if it was me, and then all these funny, interesting, strange things would come out. So I always said to them, don't, make, don't write a character like you think a spy should be. You're the spy. Yeah. Make the character come from you. And of course, this is, you know, we hear this repeated from other people as well. That's those flaws, those uncertainties, those sure. that suddenly makes it. Well, look alive. at John Le Carre. I mean, what makes George yeah. Smiley a great character is he's essentially John Le Carre. Yeah. And not only is he that character, but he gave him a tragic flaw that his wife is having a bunch of affairs and everybody knows it. So here's a guy that's supposed to be so smart and so good at rooting out spies and moles and stuff like that, cuckolded constantly by his wife. And she has that great line at the end which she says to him at the end of Tinker Tailor, she goes, life is really a puzzle to you, isn't it, George? And we think, wow, a hero we love is so tragically flawed. Yeah, perfect. That's the second interview in a row with John McCarry. In fact, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy has been referenced as well. well so he's it's such a, you a can't go brilliant, wrong, can you? Brilliant yeah, yeah. writer. Absolutely love it. Um, so for you now, you're enjoying your murder mysteries. Is that what your you would describe your? Yeah, my, I, I call mine uh, psychological thrillers or mystery thrillers because there are elements of thriller in it. There's a lot of twists and turns and a lot of suspense. Uh, I don't write cozies. I don't write, you know, the kinds of uh, mysteries that, mine are kind of intense uh, with a lot of dark themes, but because I used to be a comedy writer, the conversations between my hero and the police with whom he works, there's often a lot of humor because they are, are the best of enemies yeah. in a certain way. And that's what makes it fun to write. And any thoughts of film and TV again, or is that oh, bit done? We always have someone sniffing around talking about turning the books into a TV series. I've been around the pool long enough yeah. to know <laughs> that interest is terrific and it's great for your ego, but the, the journey from that interest to something getting on screen 
is a very torturous journey, yeah, so yeah. we'll see. I often quote Douglas Adams, who uh, put at the front of one of his books is that Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy has now been optioned by Hollywood, so it's going to be made any decade now. Any, any, any decade now, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go, Tom. Difficult not to think of Columbo when you introduce Dennis Columbo. Yep. And Columbo, I, I feel, was a man who understood the psychology of people. You reckon? You ever watched a Columbo episode? No. Oh, my. He's never watched a Columbo episode, John. John's behind the camera operating things. So, well, um, Columbo was a brilliant detective. Here, I, I guess it was in New York. Was he in New York, Columbo? I forgot that wrong. Maybe he was somewhere else. No. He wasn't in New York. No, I think he was somewhere else. He was in the West Coast. Okay, but he would say he would go in and he'd ask a couple of things. But what he'd spot was a few things going on in the room, the way the person acted, and just before he left, his famous thing was just just one more thing, and then he'd ask that key question that unlocked the case. So this psychology, and I really like Dennis's. Uh, the way that he was talking about like these effects and we talked about Tony Blair and George W Bush as an example so we all remember the decision they made about going to war in 2003 very controversial decision lots of people opposed it some people backed it but what's interesting is is the effect it had on them as individuals and to this day and that's what's going to make your novel work it's referring back to that thinking this is not just an event that's happened for the story but every sentence you write about that character from then on is informed by the decisions they make yeah, 100%. I mean, I sat in both David and Dennis's uh, sort of speeches or conference talks, and um, yeah, they kind of they both stood out because uh, rather than just talking about how to approach like the craft or something, they were much more about how to think about decisions that will impact your character and, and therefore inform your character. So rather than just going, oh, my character's really strong because of this, or my character's got this weakness because of this, putting them in situations or, or giving them uh, like traumas or psychological things that will literally like influence the way they behave through the story uh, and definitely fleshing it out more than just you know necessarily using your own and do, experience. Do you know what the great thing about getting this bit right is it actually helps you write the novel. Yeah. When you start to think about oh how would I you know how would I feel and Dennis said how would you feel about that if you were faced with this decision one day at a railway station and you, you come home how would that evening be for you? How would it be a month later? And that allows you to you know that gives you the ideas the the content of your writing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, welcome to the podcast. The first one down. We've got a couple more to go uh, here in Dumbo in New York. We've got two fantastic episodes. I mentioned James Rollins. We have a couple of superstars uh, to interview coming up in the next couple of episodes. Uh, and I should also say that although this is Thriller Fest, a lot of what we're talking about pertains to all writing, not just thrillers. So don't worry if you're a romance writer or another genre, you're going to pick up plenty of stuff from these, uh, these episodes. Right, the ferry is in. That looks like it should be taking us for lunch over there. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it always says yes to lunch. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. The first of three episodes, we're back next week with some more good stuff from New York and Fullerfest. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.